I'm on Instagram live doing the new normal. Deborah Francis White here and I'm on Instagram live doing the new normal from the guilty feminist and today my special guest is Dan Schreiber from No Such Thing as a Fish. Now we did a guilty feminist uh, No Such Thing as a Fish crossover not long ago No Such Thing as a Guilty Feminist uh, and it was a it was a big hit we must do another one of those after a after after the after the now times. Um, so I'm going to bring on Dan in a minute uh, when a few more people come. In fact, Schreiberland there, he's, he's asked to be in, in the video. Now, Trelise Cooper, very kindly, after my glasses broken, no opticians were open, very kindly said they would send me some new glasses because they didn't have them in my strength, so they found some for me. And then they sent me... I'm going to show you this because it's incredible. Hold on. How do I turn this around? Here we go. Um... They sent me this beautiful box and inside, look, look, in a very beautiful, in a beautiful silk bag, they, they sent me, these are also Trillies Cooper glasses that are a little bit beaten up. So I have a grab bag now of like a dozen uh, pairs of glasses because they said they, they, uh, that I can have something for every, like different colours and different things because I've, I've, um, I've worn them a lot in press. So I'm going to grab some at random. This is Lucky Dip. And they're the ones I'm going to wear today. All right. Let's see what I've pulled out. Okay. I'm going to turn them around. Are these the ones? Ha, 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 ha. These are my new Trelease Cooper glasses. that I have done a lucky dip from my lucky box because I'm a very lucky girl. Hold on. All right. Ready? Oh, wow. How exciting is that? I have brand new glasses in so many different colours. My most of my career is now answering the question, where did you get those glasses? Um, and the, the answer is always Trillise Cooper. And it's a new, she's a New Zealand designer. And it turns out she's a fan of the podcast and I'm a fan of her glasses. I'm taking my hair out because I think it looks better. Um, so I will be answering that question a lot more now, frankly, a lot more because I have a lot more fabulous glasses. So I think it's time to bring Dan Schreiber on. Let me see. Is he there? Yes, he is. Let's add in five, four, three, and Dan Schreiber. There you, there you are. I can't believe you've got those glasses. That whole batch. I go. I go one pair at a time. Well, these That's are my really reading glasses. So, and I, <laughs> it's like I can have the sort of average strength, but I need them for screens. Like, if I'm looking at you now on a screen, you're very blurry. So I need okay. them to talk to you. But. Um, but I only need like, it's like a 1.25. My regular vision, Dan, and I don't wish to intimidate or brag, is better than 2020. That's impossible. That's superhero. I don't know what it you're isn't. talking about. No, How is that possible? That's what I said to the optometrist. Right. Um, uh, Rob Dale, optometrist and stars, I call him. I live next door to him. And it turned out like he was friends with all these celebrities. And, uh, and anyway, so we call him Dan, uh, we, call it, we call him Rob Dale, uh, optometrist for the stars. And he... He uh, um, uh, went for my eye test and he said, yes, you need reading glasses, but your regular vision is better than 2020. And I said, how can it be, though? And he said, 2020 is just the sort of good standard. He's like, that's what you're looking to have. Oh, OK. But it's not the best. It's just like it's like a it's like an a, a B plus A minus. It's like yeah. good or like a, maybe an A, maybe a low A. But it's not like it's a two one. It's not a first. That's, that's what it is. That's so cool. I didn't know that. That's a great yeah. plan. So I've got a first class vision, distinction vision. Distinction. For, wow. Yeah. For like, if I look into my neighbor's window across the road, I can see absolutely everything and have done actually. I mean, I've not said this before live on the internet, but, but years ago I saw what was effectively a French film, putting it discreetly, <laughs> in profile. It was absolutely incredible, but it, it like, looked so elegant and gorgeous and it was like somebody had done a silhouette of the most gorgeous way anyone could make love. And I was just like, complete, I was here with a friend and we were absolutely, compa and I, I'm ashamed to say we did not look away. We weren't seeing anything, <laughs> but we just went, it's so perfect. I mean, we didn't film it, just to be very clear, but it was so perfect. It wasn't like I was getting aroused from it. It was just like, they were so, they had done it. It was almost like they'd set it up, but I'm sure they hadn't. Yeah. 
Um, we, um, I, when um, I used to edit Museum of Curiosity, the BBC radio show in mm. um, Clapham, and my editor's place was up on the second floor, and he, he had his editing suite set up by a window, and I used to sit by the window side, and if you looked out across the road, there was a sort of frosted bathroom window, which mm. clearly the, the flat was lived in by a group of guys, because it was the shower right next to it, and you could see basically guys just you know, having a having a wank, basically. Uh, Can't and, believe and you said wank on my charming tea time I know, I'm so down. sorry. I, I said I, French film. I know, and I paused and I was like, I was searching for the okay, word and well, it just didn't come to I'll me. I'll throw really it to sorry. me next time. Having, and I would say, uh, some pleasurable alone time. Taking some time out of the day for themselves. Having a little good. bit I, of me time. Like I couldn't come believe, up with... Can't know. believe I've done this to your show straight away. I, I'm not having, even going to finish the story. I mean, anyway, so they were having some some authentic pleasurable alone time yeah they were having solo solo sessions and that's the even that sounded weird that didn't sound good i think we should move on i think i don't think my language is going to be any are useful. you sure there's no there's no end to that story there's no twist well they, they came there was kind of like clearly the shower ended person left next person came in would do the same thing leave mm. and it was very hard because there i am editing a show where you know it's like british museum curators talking about babylonian cuneiform and on the left is a, 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 well, you can say what it is, yeah. So, okay, so the turn of phrase, it was very hard, is a, is, is, is a poor one in this situation. <laughs> it was very hard because I was curating, I was, I was editing something that was quite sort of technical and charming, but not sexy. Yeah. And then I was watching a series of people in a shower. So what you don't want to say there is it was very hard, just say, there was a there was an, a paradox or an irony there, or that was it was quite a tr tricky work environment. Something like that could be good. Yeah, tricky work environment. That's very good. That's yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, but I learned I so like much about language when I talked to you. Coming in one after the other. Mm. It was it was weird. It was very very weird. Uh, <laughs> I, I I didn't watch it though. I didn't I didn't do what you did. I I did turn away. But occasionally you look out a window and it was just still going on. My God. It well, was very weird. We, I could only see a silhouette, but it was just, it was sort of the art of the silhouette I was watching. We were just like, wow, that looks so, because I think they were up on their knees on a bed. And then they were sort of, it was just, it was like a French film. It was like, a, it was like something that had been shot uh, to look very elegant and beautiful and in profile in the silhouette. And I think, it, honestly, they were just, unless they were, I mean, they might have been, enjoying the voyeurism they might have deliberately done it in the window because they knew people in camden oh, would be watching. Cool, yeah mm, well i i like to think so because i did watch so hopefully <laughs> they were enjoying that <laughs> i can't believe i'm a feminist but i once watched my neighbors having sex but there are there are sort of things that you see when you're because we're on the top floor of a terrace yeah um which is all these houses along the street have all been turned into flats i think i think i think they're victorian but they were turned into flats after the First World War, I think, or maybe the Second World War. I think most flats happened around the Second World War. Um, anyway, this is not the new normal. This is the old normal. Now when I'm talking about the, 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 uh, the, the implications of wartime um, and how they change uh, society, it does segue me brilliantly into our new normal and what changes the world might come up with uh, for us off the back of this. And you're such an interesting person to talk to because you know so much about history and so many unusual uh, facts about history and, and different cultures. Um, so, so, but my first question is, how the hell are you? I'm good, thank you, yeah. I'm, how are you dealing with it all? Because you've got a new baby, yeah? Yeah, I mean, w that was very scary. Um, my son, Ted, was born four weeks ago and that was petrifying. So anything that's happening now in terms of our life is is nothing in comparison to that. It was very scary going into hospital. Um, a, not knowing if I was going to be allowed into hospital. Um, we're in the countryside at the moment, but we do live in London. And we transferred just before this all broke out down here to my wife's in-law's house. Sorry, my wife's uh, parents' house, my in-law's. And um, in London, there's a lot of cases where the hospitals were saying partners weren't allowed to be there for the birth. Uh, so that was that was very scary because my wife, uh, Fenella, she has a condition where she's, um, it's a phobia of birth, basically. So weird paradox, desperate to a be a mother. A phobia of birth? 
Is yeah, that she... not just being a woman, though, being a cis woman is, is, do we all not have a phobia of birth or is it pro pro ex probably, exacerbated? Hers, hers was clinically. She, um, she lost oh, wow. a school friend um, in childbirth. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, and it was, it was, it really, it really affected her and it, ended up being the hospital that we went to have our child in for our first child and our second child. So there was a lot of uh, stuff going on. And, and she thought, basically, she thought she was going to die in childbirth. And so we desperately were trying to to get a, a C-section. that's horrible. That's it, so it, awful. It was horrific. And it's a shame because it's kind of like when you talk to someone who's claustrophobic or, you know, you try to apply your own logic to it. But the reality is when someone gets in an enclosed space, there's no logic. It's it's mm -hmm. a fear, right? Like fears are fears, and and she... I have phobias, and it is yeah, it's the worst. It's, it's horrible. It's... So yeah, so we um, so the double fear here was that I wasn't going to be allowed in there. Whereas we're kind of we become a real sort of uh, team over the nine months, you know, mm -hmm. getting ready for it and so on. But and, she'd um, done it once before, and had that. Did she have that phobia before? She did. Um, the phobia was the first time round. It was much better this time round until. Corona hit, and then suddenly, you know, the idea of going into a hospital with masks and all that sort of stuff. Um, it was, and you know, if she had to stay in, would I be allowed in at all? Um, last time we had huge problems post birth um, with uh, mastitis that turned into an abscess, and like there was a lot of there was she had to have surgery, and if that happened this time round, she would have to be in hospital for weeks. But we and the kids wouldn't be allowed in there, like all that sort of stuff. It was it was a different side to the sort of um, corona pandemic that um, we experienced. But it all went well, it went really well. We had a, we had a really sort of um, quite, there were no complications at all in the birth or the post-birth. There's always, there's, I mean, no matter what, there's always post-birth things that is not spoken about enough of how there's just so many different, be it breastfeeding or be it, um, uh, stitching or or internal stuff like there's just so much that goes on for months and months and months and months and you don't know what you're going to get and fortunately this time it's been a billion times better than what it was the first time around because the first time around That's was like right. a war and this time this time is much better but um God, yeah, imagine so, no, if you hadn't been able to be in there which hap has happened to some people a lot of and people. she's phobic and she's like terrified of dying in childbirth and you're not there it would be well, the anxiety of that will cause ex and exacerbate something. So I'm so grateful you were able to be in there with her. And oh yeah, um, I mean, it was it was very lucky. We actually had this really sweet moment where I wasn't allowed into the hospital until the point where she was going directly into the surgery. So basically, I would have to run into the hospital. I'd have to go to exactly the spot outside the surgery. Um, they would take my temperature, make sure that I didn't have a fever. If I had a fever, they would have sent me out immediately. So that was a big worry that, you know, what if I just yeah, had a random... Think, oh, God, yeah. yeah what if I like, just feel hot? Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, fortunately, I passed that. But there was two hours where she had to go in and be on her own. And, she, and I walked her in and she was shaking and, and just so scared that I wasn't going to be allowed in. So I sat on the car with my mother-in-law and we just sat staring at the hospital, just going, God, we don't know when we're going to get a call or anything. And she's all alone and it was so horrible. And... Um, then she suddenly noticed she walked she heard a bus go by the window of the room that she was in and she thought hang on that must be the front of the hospital and she looked out and she could see our car out there mm -hmm. and she quickly called and went look look up look up at the window and, and we saw each other and we were suddenly together again but at this oh. distance but like it it suddenly that was the game changer where we all calmed down because we could see each other there was no longer this big wall in the way and then and then two hours later i got in and we had our son, Ted Harpo Shriver. Very exciting. I, this is such a beautiful, heartwarming story of labor in lockdown. It was a very, it's odd to have a Corona baby, you know, it's a Corona Times baby. It's, it was, um, it was bizarre. The amazing thing was being in the hospital, you know, you're, you're doing that thing of saying to every single doctor and nurse there, thank you, you know, thank you so mm. much for everything you're doing for all of us. You know, this is, you know, we go out every Thursday, but uh, that's that feels nothing in comparison to us. Can you give us five minutes just to say thank you, thank you, thank you to your faces? Mm -hmm. And they were so in the way that kind of like superheroes are um, just like, oh, no, no, it's my job. It's fine. Like there was no sense of like, thank you. Like that means a lot. They were like, no, we're here to help you. We're this is what we do. So 
That's we should pay doctors and nurses and people, other people who work in hospitals a lot more than we do. Because as it turns out, when push comes to shove, they're the people we really, really need. Yeah. yeah. Teachers yeah. as well and people who work in supermarkets and people who deliver things. Other than that, turns out we can function. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's, um, it's a thing that you only really ever remember when you're back in hospital. And it's, it's mm -hmm. a shame because really, I mean, every single time that we've been in hospital and particularly the last birth was, you know, those were my heroes. Like you just, mm -hmm. you just think we should be every day. We shouldn't use a pandemic to be the point where we're saying, thank you. Like these people have decided for their entire life, they're going to help everyone else. It's, it's just wonderful that they exist. I I did a job swap once with a nurse. So basically I, I, I shadowed some nurses and then we had a nurse to come on the show and do some stand up comedy. And um, she, it was the only time I've ever been in a hospital where I or someone I loved wasn't in, in a bad situation. Because normally you're in a very heightened state in a hospital. And I mean, I don't think I've actually ever been to hospital as myself. Not maybe right. it may be, I have actually into the emergency room, but I haven't stayed overnight in a hospital, I don't think. But like you go to visit family or friends or someone's had a baby or whatever, but you're all in a heightened state. And just going there and shadowing nurses and seeing what they really do when you're calm is extraordinary because you realize how much the doctors are diagnosing, but then the nurses have to carry everything out. The doctor's yeah. actually just going, do that, do that, do that. She needs that, he needs that. And then they don't have time to be doing all of that. And how much the nurses were explaining to me that they don't want to, that, you know, a lot of people go, oh, you're a nurse because you, you, you couldn't be a doctor. And mm. so many nurses were going, it's not like it's a very different job. The thing we love about nursing is you get to talk to people, you get to make them feel better, you get to cater to them. There was an old man who wanted a, a nurse went over and just had a chat to him because she could see something was wrong that he was just not comfortable in himself. And she just picked up on it. He hadn't complained, but she went kind of, are you all right? And she talked to her. And then she said to someone else, can you give him a shave before you come off your shift? Because she said, I just could see he was, un you know, he's lying in this ward, he's wearing yeah, a yeah. gown, but he was an old man. And she was like, he just wanted a shave. That's going to make him feel more human today. Yeah. So, and, and she said that the problem with the nursing crisis, that there are no longer enough nurses employed, she said, if you've got the temperament to want to be a nurse and you can't give that man a shave, all you can do is throw pills at him and run to the next bed, otherwise someone's going to die, then it's heartbreaking for you much more than it would be for a regular person who didn't have the disposition to be a nurse. Mm. And so at the moment, she said, we can't do our job, which is the bit we love, which is, yes. how are you chatting to the to the family, making sure everything's okay, making sure they're comfortable, making sure they're connected, and, and of course, medicine, but it's within a, con within a wider context. Yeah. And they were talking about um, giving people a good death. They said like, yeah, some of it's saving lives, but they, so everyone's got to die at some point. And either making sure their family's there at the right moment, like being aware, you've got to come in now. Yeah. We, yeah. we can tell from experience, they may have four to six hours and or, sometimes they don't have family nearby or they don't have family and sitting with them and being with them and holding their hand and talking to them as they die. And they, they said that that's a big part of the job and it's an important part of the job for them. And if they have to let someone die alone, they go home just in agony because they're the kind of person that wants to be a nurse and doesn't yeah. want that to happen. Yeah. And you, as you or I being the kind of selfish narcissist comedians that we are, yeah. we'd be like, oh, it's a long day. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have that temperament down. <laughs> we don't. I'll tell you what, though. It's an interesting thing that you and I do do. So we make podcasts, obviously. And um, yours, yours socially is, a, is, I think, changes a lot of lives. I think yours is, is held up as something that helps lives and empowers and so yeah. on. And, and with Fish, you know, we do silly factual yeah. stuff. But as consequence of creating a gang, um, is that people who might might sometimes feel stressed or lonely come to us and they chill out via mm -hmm. us, which is which is a nice thing. And when we were in hospital last time, so we this is my first son. We were having um, we had the birth and there was all the chaos that came afterwards, and particularly the mastitis, which my wife Vanella went into the top one percent of um, problems with mastitis, like the highest end you could go, oh. which is it formed into a rock solid, uh, solid abscess that had to have surgery and sepsis, it went septic. So it was really dangerous. And we were at the hospital, this was in Tunbridge Wells, um, now Pembury. And the, um, 
they they booked her in for surgery and we met the surgeon who was going to do it and she spoke us through the whole thing and she's the she's the surgeon who comes in and on a friday she will do every single bit of breast surgery that needs to happen on that day so Fenella was slotted into one of those and we weren't allowed to go down to see Fenella for the surgery and we had to wait not only after the surgery but for hours after we were told hours after when she'd recovered that she would come back up so we weren't even told whether or not the surgery had gone well. You know, that was not mm -hmm. part of the process. You just have to sit and wait and hope for, for good things. So we were sitting upstairs and waiting and it was petrifying because you just hope everything went well. And we got a knock on the door and it was the surgeon and she had come up and she said, I just want to let you know that um, Fennell is doing well. It was a success. We've got the abscess out completely. It's all going to be fine. And I was like, thank you so much. That's, that's amazing to hear. And then she said, sorry, just before I go, the, I just wanted to quickly say, I do this every Friday. This is this is my thing every Friday. And sometimes it goes well, like today with your wife. Sometimes it goes horribly wrong. And those are the most heartbreaking moments. And every Friday when I get home after work, my husband is sitting there with a bottle of wine open, ready for me. He's got a glass. We both sit down and we both listen to the latest episode of No Such Thing as a Fish. And it brings me back and it reminds me oh to, my God. that life is good. And this is like, this was someone who just, you know, saved my wife's life in my eyes, you know, telling wow. me that I play a little role in her thing. And, and so we do do silly things, but mm -hmm. I, uh, that was the one time yeah. where I went, okay, do you know what? Uh, maybe, maybe actually we're doing something that's useful for, for the people who are saving lives. It's an ecosystem. Sorry to yeah. be so pathetic as to cry, but- You're crying, I'm, oh, I can't see that. Firstly, I'm in <laughs> lockdown. Firstly, I'm in lockdown. But second, I can see where that story was gonna go. And as somebody who tries to put good things out into the world and you don't know what the consequences of those things are, I find that very moving because um, I agree. I think what you've got with Fish is there isn't the same social agenda as there is with Guilty Feminists, but there is a sort of, it feels like you're part of the gang. You're very inclusive with it. And yeah. it feels like these people are your friends and you're not going to be judged as, you know, as 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 not clever enough um it's a space you can come to be joyful and especially the shows with the audience there's something i think people don't realize the value of having a podcast with an audience because then it feels like you're part of a team or a tribe and i think yeah. i absolutely hear what she's saying that actually when she comes home on a friday night if it's gone well or it's gone badly she just needs to come back and neutralize and be herself so that she can go out and take those risks again and operate again <laughs> So to Absolutely. make her feel human and connected, this is, art is a very important part of our ecosystem and, it, and we don't understand quite how much it is. But the brilliant thing about podcasting is we can do it in lockdown. Yes, very lucky, isn't it? It's, yeah, we can continue on with it. I, it's, we're, we're currently doing it over Zoom, as I'm sure you are, or whatever program you're using. But yeah, um, Zoom, yeah. yeah it's, it's um, and the messages that we're getting from a lot of people in lockdown, uh, so not care workers necessarily or key workers, but people with anxiety issues and um, who mm -hmm. or actually, because I mean, we've heard a lot about how people with anxiety are actually flourishing at the moment because this is a world that they know quite well of being locked in. But um, we do have a lot of people with depression, for example. We, we're constantly getting letters and we they come to different places. So they'll come to me on my dms on twitter or an email to anna of the podcast so we share them with each other and I, it's bizarre that that's the because it, it's not the purpose of why you make the show but you suddenly learn y yeah. you're helping people just by going on just by keeping a routine and they're just saying mm -hmm. thank you because i'm i i that's you know, my little safety i know yeah, exactly i know yeah. that i've got a no such thing as a fish to look forward to and in a time where we can control hardly anything anymore it feels like oh well that's that's part of my routine. I was so, I don't know if we were talking, I did your show the other night, um, Show Us Your Shit, which was brilliant, by the way. It was so much fun. Yeah, um, it. And it is a show, uh, you should. You guys should all watch it. But it's uh, where people show Dan Schreiber their shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a colloquial use of the term shit, just to be yeah. clear. Just stuff around the house. Just not, yeah. just not to be taken literally. Well, um, you took it literally. You're I the first person to, yeah, I show did, me some I, actual shit. I, not your I, own, a cat. Just cats. to be clear. <laughs> I have a kitty little robot gang um, because we live in a flat and we don't have anywhere to like, you know, I hate kitty little boxes with litter going all over the floor and it stinks and everything. So we keep, it's like a robot that sort of looks like a time machine and it rotates itself so the crap goes into this thing. I just have to explain that just because I just don't want that getting around. I don't want that to be a headline 
No, because the absolutely. tabloids pick this stuff up sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to end up in, or, or Londoner's Diary sometimes, they'll write something snippy. Right. And it'll be like, Deborah Francis White showed Dan Schreiber her loo. <laughs> that's not what happened. No, that's not what happened. Uh, just to be clear. Yeah. Um, uh, why was I talking about that? That I did your show? I can't uh, remember now. No, when I, I did your show, what, what were we talking about? Uh, we were just talking about um, distractions and... Oh, um, yes. Um, uh, yes, I, I think maybe I was talking to you about this on your show, but um, that my routine has become ludicrously important to me now. And I'm the most unroutined person in right. real life. Yeah, but yeah. now it's like I can't control anything. But what I can control is I do exercise with my Zoom you know, I have these Zoom one-on-ones like d dancing and personal training. And I, between 9.30 and 11.30, that's what I do. And that's what I do. And that's fine. Because if that's what I do between those hours, then the life is okay, totally in my control. Yeah. And it's <laughs> so random because my whole life has been massively unroutined. Now, like I have the same thing for lunch every day. It's weird. Um, which brings me back to uh, your new normal and how you're coping in quarantine. Yeah. Have you found any strategies for staying emotionally or mentally stable while in lockdown? Um, it's, it's an interestingly timed moment of having a new child and having a lockdown because the emotions that I did last time for the family are similar to what's happening now, really, in a way. Um, like the, the routine is kind of out the window in a way when you have two kids i mean that so there's a two-year-old who we're we're trying to deal with how we become good parents in a lockdown because that's mm -hmm. extremely hard you know there's a lot of television going on there's a lot of i i come from a childhood where i had a lot of toys so i'm constantly just buying him toys because right now my son has no friends he can't see anyone mm -hmm. and it's so hard to tell a two-year-old why he can't hang out with other kids or why when we see the park he can't run in, onto the swings and it's mm -hmm. we've managed successfully to sort of explain what coronavirus is so if we walk around and he goes to touch something we'll go no no and he'll go naughty coronavirus we'll go, yes <laughs> naughty coronavirus and we, we should smack coronavirus's bum bum yes smack coronavirus's bum like he's he's really into uh, the idea that this is a thing that it's getting in the way of his life um He's, he's taken that, he's two and a half, but he's managed to take that on really well. Um, but in terms of like my emotions, the last time that we had a child, and, and similarly now, when things are going wrong or you're worried about your, your child, I, I tend to take the, the stance of, I just have to remain optimistic about everything, that it's not gonna be bad, it's gonna, hey, it's gonna be fine, everything's gonna be fine oh, you've got a bit of blood coming out of your C-section. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. We're going to be fine. Like, just because if you go down a different road, it becomes very scary. And I'm, I'm kind of doing that anyway for the, for the fact that we have a second child, but also mm. for lockdown. It, those two have really blended. Just, I imagine with a newborn, you've sort of got to... I was talking about this today with Steve Alley, who's... Um, you, I think, do you know Steve? He's, a Syri he's from Syria. And no, he I don't came, think so. He came to Tom and me uh, nearly three years ago now as a Syrian refugee. Oh yeah, of course, I've he's not met him, but yeah. Our, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's very yeah. much part of our, very important part of our family. And we were talking about this today and he was saying, you cannot deal with trauma when you're going through trauma. You have to, he said, you absolutely have to uh, use cognitive dissonance. You have to be more hopeful. You have to believe in things. You have to shelve things. You have to, this is how you cope. Yeah. And because he's coped with a lot, I mean, a lot more trauma than this, but he said, you know, he says it's a different experience if you've not been through a disaster zone or a war zone or something like that. And he's very good about yeah. uh, separating that out and saying, you know, don't, you can't go around going, oh, I haven't been in a war, so it's fine. You know, he said that, that you'll cope with it differently. Um, but he said it's really important. Like, that I know I'm shelving things. I know I'm going, I'm, I'm behaving in slightly unusual ways for me and it's a right. coping strategy and maybe in a year's time i'll process that but i imagine if you've got well as you're looking at two small children as well and looking mm. at their future i imagine there's a certain point where you just have to go everything's going to be fine because it has to be because these small people need to grow up into a livable world yeah and i have to get on with the business of parenting right now every day because nappies need to be changed and you know uh, uh, nap times need to be observed otherwise this is all going to go into chaos 
Yeah, but the flip the flip side as well is um, there's also, and I think I think quite a few people are having an interesting experience where we're all feeling a bit guilty to say this out loud. Um, the mm. the the way that Corona and the lockdown, not Corona, but the lockdown has allowed us to spend more time with our families, for example. Mm. Like right now, I'm I'm getting such precious time with my my two year old son Wilf. I'm not having to commute to work. I'm able in the lunch hour that I take to take him to his nap and I'll lay with him and we'll tell stories and then he'll fall asleep and then I'll get up, have my lunch and then go back to work. I can't do that on a day to day basis. I'm getting to hang out with my newborn son rather than disappear into the office all day. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, this has genuinely been one of the best things that's the, the lockdown, nothing else, yeah, not obviously, corona. No, no, obviously no, no, no. nothing else. I'm not, no, no. not putting that in there, but this has been the most precious thing that could ever have happened at this particular timing so it's a and that's a bizarre thing because i i hate saying that aloud as a you know i know oh, a lot of people are going people yeah, are going through hell right now but people are dying and, yeah, and how could we how dare we say that we are finding anything about that ourselves hmm. uh, but but human beings are programmed to find silver linings if we if we were not we would not be the we would not be the top of the food chain. We would not run the world. Mm. Um, we silver linings are our bag. We go okay. What can we make from this? What's the opportunity here? What's the best thing that can come out of this? Nece what what necessity is the mother of invention? What can we invent? And yeah, yeah. And that's who that's how we're programmed. So we should not feel guilty about it, but we just have to contextualize it in terms of the privilege that we have exactly. when we discuss it. Because obviously, yeah. if you're in a refugee camp there's nothing good about this there's only it's only horrendous you know yeah. and of course there are people in your exact situation in you know i went out to lesbos um just last year and in autumn of last year and there were people in your exact situation with a newborn and a two-year-old living in a tiny tent in the most cramped loads and loads and loads of tents and they had to walk to you know inadequate showers and um, say inadequate you know the the um the people out there doing showers and sanitation are incredible but they themselves say we cannot we can't build enough we can't get enough the sanitation overflows we're doing what we can brilliant things that they can do but with not enough facilities so you know there's you know when you introduce coronavirus into that it's not like oh well i'm having this quality time element so yeah. you know as lo i think as long as we understand the, the how lucky we are and sort of what so what can we do with our platform to kind of make it easier for somebody else? Um, you know, we are human and you're right. You're getting to spend time with your children that you wouldn't otherwise get to spend. And I do hope that when we come out of this, we reassess a lot about the way we were living. I think we will. I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I, th I think even within, like, say, within our company at QI, there's a lot of chat about how we operate even even in the now when we're all on our zoom meeting and going well this works this all works right now why wh what's the thing with the offices what's the thing with uh all the big commuting and you know i i it won't necessarily just be about commuting and being in an office but you know uh the way that employees have been able to see their children run mm -hmm. past you know that the, the classic bbc moment of the two kids coming in and then suddenly that guy is a, oh, yeah. a mega set. But that's, that's happening globally right now where kids are running in because you've got a life going on around you and it's humanizing these scary bosses who are trying to hold a dominating feel over their employees and reducing them into humanity. And, mm -hmm. and I, think, I think that will change. I think people are gonna have a different relationship with their work colleagues. Um, it's, it'll be interesting. I think and you're right. I was talking to Ned Sedgwick today who does Global Pillage with us. And he was saying, like, I look back on my old life, old life with some sense of how much I, I he said something like hubris and excess, you yeah. know, and, uh, and we were talking about what we might change. And um, I said, I feel like I will look at my instead of cramming my diary, like if you said to me, can you do this or can you come here? I go, oh, well, that week I've got Thursday night free. And now I don't like I was doing something every night and every day and every minute of every day. And I think now I would go. I'm going to look at the shape of that week. Yeah. And I go, oh, that week's quite busy. So actually, why don't I look into the following week or the one after that, rather than going, there's a, there's a two hour window. So yes, I can fill it because I've realized what anxiety and what pressure there was on my body running around the way I was Yeah. in such a manic way because it was possible 
going, I'll be here, I'll be here, I'll do this, I'll do this. And especially, as you say, when you've got two small children, it's really easy to let work and all of the, you know, and the pressure you must feel to be successful as well when you've got two small children. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You almost want to accelerate that. You almost want to go, okay, I, I need to do more now. I need to make sure they have a good life and they have, you know, that we've got enough money for them to be, you know, uh, comfortable and fed. And yeah, it, mm -hmm. it does. It really accelerates. And buy them toys because they're in <laughs> so many lockdown. Toys. Although so many I, toys. Feel, I feel like some of the toys are for you just from some of the Instagram posts I've seen. Uh, there's been a lot of accusations from certain people. Uh, Fennell is one of them making that point. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. What, um, was the, what was the first present that you bought your son, your first son, your eldest son? Uh, um, wow. It was a Spike Milligan print for the wall. Um, and then What's I bought, that I bought I in bought any him. real way for a baby? Well, it's, it's inspiring to look at on the wall. I think, you know, to have interesting art on the wall is really oh. good. I, also, I bought him a original Mork and Mindy toy of Robin Williams in its original packaging from the Which 1970s. Which will be so cool because all of his friends will be really into Mork and Mindy. When he's five, yeah. he'll be able to invite his friends around and go, guess what I've got? <laughs> Nanu Nanu. And then he'll be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I he'll know. He'll be like, is he a YouTuber? And he'll yeah. be like, no. He's from a television show from the 1970s. 1970s. Well, in, in your scenario, you've got Wilf playing with the toy. He's not taking it out of the package. I don't know where you got that from. That's, that's sitting on a oh, shelf. Oh, I see. I see. It's a collector's <laughs> item. Yeah. So it's something he's allowed to look at but not touch. No, I, I, um, I promised myself, and because I'm not a collector, I, I open stuff up. If the day he wants to open it and play with it, he can do that. I'm, I've bought them to be played with as okay. opposed to... Yeah, yeah, definitely. But the way you say it is as if you when that day comes it will be a heartbreak it's like oh, the day that he says it i'm gonna let him because that's the right thing to do if and that's if what he wants to do he wants, if he fine. wants to do the wrong thing if he if wants to a, if he wants to be a philistine <laughs> it's not my job to inhibit that yeah um can i ask you is there anything that surprised you about your response to lockdown or humanity's response to lockdown or british humanity's response to lockdown um to know that that there's so many different angles of things that surprise me in a good way and a bad way um i i'm surprised that we're ready for the lockdown to end so desperately that we're listening to an argument from someone who doesn't even know what they're saying on tv that we're sort of like great okay let's go back out let's hang out i just say well, what no that was sort of beautiful thing just before um i came on here of jacinda ardern on this side of the screen and Boris Johnson on this side of the screen and Jacinda in New Zealand talking and then Boris talking and then the same thing matching the movements that they did. And you're looking at Jacinda who from the get go, I mean, her story of how she even got into power was phenomenal. So that she's already nailed it just to, just to get into place in, in New Zealand as the prime minister. Her response to this, her foresight, her understanding of the science, her, her just absolute dedication to saying to a country, everyone just consider yourself infected with this and let's go from there versus how he did it um, is, is truly just incredible. And so the idea that when you see him saying stuff like, okay, Wednesday, start going out, you just think, why, why mentally are we all going, great, thank you, we've been dying to do that. We, we can't, we need to keep staying in. We've got to save lives. It's so, insane that we're even giving it a percentage of, a, of, of an optimistic oh he might be right it's, like, I, I was saying to, the other day that I feel to me it's like it's like there are two houses next to each other and one house is full of money and one house is full of people and they're both on fire and the fire brigade can only save one it's just it's not an ethical issue it's just like well you save one with the people in it right yeah obviously you don't let billionaires make that decision and I tweeted that and somebody put uh, a cartoon of a version of the trolley problem you know the trolley problem? Oh yeah, we're yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, so yeah. if you it's something like if you divert the trolley this way, X people on the trolley will die. So yeah. you've got it and if you go this way, if you let it keep going, two people are gonna die on the track. So you've got to make a moral decision. And what's interesting is most people will say, I can't be responsible for the deaths of more people to save the deaths of the lives of two it's something like that it's something about your responsibility and yeah the, and the um the the, ca the cartoon parody of that for this was uh you can if you pull the lever you can save 
um, all the you can save the lives of the people on the track, but the trolley business uh, will lose money and uh, there will be a lower rate of efficiency. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's like that's sort of what we're dealing with now. We're yeah, it's so true. I, I saw have... just just while I was mentioning uh, Jacinda, I saw a really nice tweet the other day, which is there's been a lot of call, a sort of like you know jokey call at Jacinda to run the world, you know, get Jacinda to be like global president. It was just this one tweet that I happened upon as I was looking on a on a search term of Jacinda of someone saying, "Guys, there's there's Jacindas everywhere in every country. Just vote her in. <laughs> just find yeah. the." the find the Jacinda of your country and vote her in. We're only here because we've been voting the Borises in. Like, she's, she's not Andy unique. Me. She's not unique. They are around. Every, every person, every country has a Jacinda. What the fuck happened with Elizabeth Warren? Elizabeth Warren is so clearly yeah. a standout candidate. She's so intelligent. She's got so much experience. She's, so, she's just bright and dynamic. And she's a real Jacinda. And I know in America, everything's much more centrist and blah, blah, blah. But essentially, as a human being, she's a Jacinda. She's bright, she's smart. Yeah. She's, she's connected to other human beings. She's got a lot of experience. She started kind of grassroots. Um, why? Why? Why do not people go, oh, she's someone like me who would speak for people like me? I genuinely find it difficult to understand how the, the American election is going to be run between the, 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 the far right and the center left of the same human being. Virtually. It's just insane. It's, yeah. And I shouldn't say the same human being. That's not fair. But a man who doesn't make as much sense as Elizabeth Warren, let's put it that way. Yeah, I agree. Um, and also, the thing with women is there's very rarely outstanding accusations of uh, crime against them, mm. you know, like like assault and like not, you know, not to be evocative on a on a on a six o'clock Instagram live, but it's you know, I don't I don't know, but why we don't vote just in in everyone. It's a great point though. It's a great point. Now, can I ask you, this is a bit stepping on Show Us Your Shit, but I do oh, yeah. have a question every day and I didn't know about Show Us Your Shit when I introduced this is, do you have anything you'd like to show us? It could be a pet. Yeah. Um, it could be a, a, a headdress, an eccentric relic. It could be a Spike Milligan cartoon print. Um, anything you want to show us. Yeah. It could be a okay. baby. Well, no, this is, um, this is just, uh, so Fenella's on maternity leave at the moment. And- Good call. Um, and so she she works at Penguin. She's an editor at Penguin and a publisher. And she's I I, I mean I, her her creativity and her her ability to put her finger on the pulse of what's going on. She's I'm in awe of how creative and and clever she is and risk taking she is. So she's off obviously on maternity, but the books that she set in motion are still coming out at the moment. And. Um, She's she's actually been edit, uh, nominated as editor of the year, the basically the Oscar of book awards for this year. Wow! Um, yeah, and you know the awards are happening in July, and are they going to happen? I'm really upset because she she's always very humble about what she does, and this is the first time where I feel like it's going to be acknowledged that she's and this you powerhouse. Want to see her on a red and, carpet in a hot dress. Exactly, and I want I, I want her to get up and give a kick-ass speech because she's she's just brilliant. And, and um, you're, uh, yeah, I I love that you've assumed she's won there. And as r right <laughs> rightly, what a lovely couple you are. Oh, she's very I, I, charming and heartwarming to see. Oh, well, she's she's amazing. I'm so I'm so incredibly lucky. And and so what's really nice is while this is all going on, uh, she's got new books coming out, and this is her latest one. So this comes out tomorrow. So I was just going to show it because yeah, it's, it's an amazing book. It's um, I'll just turn the the camera here. So it's called The Consequences of Love by Gavandra Hodge. And wow. it's getting a lot of attention. So it was on the, um, the Times Magazine. This is Gavandra on the front there. And they've called wow. it the must read of the summer. It's an amazing book. It's all about Gavandra. She's a, she's a journalist. Um, but when she was seven years old, she lost her sister. She had an asthmatic attack and died. And the whole of her childhood was wiped from her head of, through the trauma. So the book is, is all about how she's found herself back in life and dealt with the memory of her sister being white and how she's tried to bring her back to life in her life. Um, it's wow. an incredible book. And Fenella actually found it because um, this is a friend of hers who lived in the same area of South London that we live in. And she was writing it as a novel. And Fenella on maternity saw a couple of chapters and went, I think this is a nonfiction book. I think you should do this and worked on it throughout her maternity. And then went back to work and had to pitch it to the work people and bought it and successfully bought it. And um, she, uh, she, so now she's back on maternity, almost in the same 
period wow. that it's coming out. So it's really nice. It's a sort of... Can you make a story of that, Dan? And then we'll do a swipe up so people can buy it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it, so it comes out Guilty tomorrow. Feminist and, I'll, and, I'll do a swipe, and I'll do a swipe up so people can pre-order. Um, uh, I, I tend to do a swipe up for Blackwells because I want to support... Uh, a, a company that sells books and pays their taxes and yeah, great people and all that. Yeah, I love um, that. So yeah, and is there a piece of activism or feminism, anything we can help you with? So is there a a cause, uh, a foundation, uh, anything you'd like us to sign, get behind, donate to, amplify? Uh, what is your what's your um, your cause of choice? My co well, my cause of choice is not a it's not a feminism cause. That's, so activism's fine. It doesn't have Activi to be feminism. Well, well activism well, tends to be feminism because generally women are involved. Unless this is a an exclusively male organisation <laughs> no. that excludes women, it is feminism. No, well, no. Let's hear it first. I shouldn't. I shouldn't assume. I shouldn't project feminism onto your cause. You t might turn out the twist might be you're a men's rights activist. Yes, exactly. So, so Down With Women is a charity that I've been running for um, a number of years. And I've, I've, got, I've met the only good woman. <laughs> That's yeah. your t-shirt. Yeah, exactly. I've literally, and I've deliberately had two boys because I don't want to bring any more women into the world. They need to go. They need to get out of here. Um, no, Jacinta it's... Ardern and my wife. Yeah, <laughs> top drawer. <laughs> top drawer. Other than that, not fussed. Not fussed. Yeah. Two's enough. That's what I say. Two's enough. <laughs> oh. um, no, it's um, it's the the thing that I tend to uh, my my wife's best friend Mimi um, had a boy who got very ill and sadly has passed mm. away. Um, he had a very rare genetic disease called Batten's. Um, something like a handful of kids in the country are diagnosed with it every year. It's very tiny, very tiny, but. It's a sign of reverse Alzheimer's. Um, the the body, the brain goes, and then the body shuts down slowly. And it was it, it was horrific, and it was horrible. And we we did a lot of charity stuff to raise money so that the conditions of the family could be better. There's medication that can be given to these kids to prolong life, but they're so expensive that no one can no one can get access to it. And so a large part of money that goes towards that is, is helping it. Um, and it, it's a very, it's, this is so rare. You've got to have two parents who both have battens in them. And the idea of two parents having that is so unbelievably rare that it's you, if you're, if you're someone who's um, pregnant right now, don't worry about it. Like it's not going to happen to you. It's so unbelievably rare, but, but when it does happen for families, it's, it's horrific. It's, and we watched it firsthand. And, and, and what's the organization called that, that deals with this? There's, there's a few. I can, I'll put a link up. Um, can you make a story again? Yeah. Just make a story and then we're, and at The Guilty Feminist, we'll share the story and everyone watching today uh, can look behind that. If, you, if you've got some spare cash because you're not going to the pub, uh, that would really help them out. And if uh, you don't, um, because you've been furloughed or lost your work, just amplify, follow. It's if you're working for especially a small charity like that now that isn't one of the marquee ones. Mm. Um, just having a bunch of people, ten new followers or a hundred new followers, is going to make them go, "Oh my God, people are looking at us!" And you know, just retweet, yeah. or just even retweeting one of their tweets or amplifying, sharing them on Instagram. Say, guys, quote tweet if you looked at this, is going to make them feel so much more like people care. And at the moment, small charities really need that. Yeah, because so much of the funds have been diverted. Exactly, and in cases like Batten's, it's it's literally like anyone who's listening now has heard of it. it that's all it is. It's oh. a it's it makes the difference to know it exists as a thing uh, because no one does. Like even without money, just just it's that thing of say its name. So just to amplify and yeah. uh, talk to people in your life about it. And if you are seriously, I mean, I know a lot of people are seriously running short of money at the moment. But yeah. uh, there are some people who've kept their full-time jobs and now they've got nowhere to spend their disposable income. So forward it to them and go, hey, would you chuck these people a tenner or, you know, would you give something to the trust or trust or whatever? You yeah. can be the one, even if you've got no money, you, you might have more time now if you've, if you've got less work. So it's really useful to amplify. Don't just sort of think, oh, I can't afford to give anything. That's, that's, it can be much more valuable to forward it to your incredibly wealthy sister. Yeah, who, exactly. Whose gym membership's been suspended. I've been um, trying once a week just to look out for, so for example, I've taken out a subscription with The Big Issue. Um, uh, and that's a and great I, thing to do. I don't really, in London, I don't really buy The Big Issue. I should, and I don't. And uh, it, it was pointed out on Twitter that there was this whole 
area of income for homeless people, which is suddenly kicked out. And it's really easy to, to subscribe to them. And I'm very lucky that I have at the moment a job that's still paying me. And I thought, well, I would have spent this money on, you know, Pret or a book or whatever. And that's I'm trying, it. I'm just trying to take that money and occasionally. And, some funds. and if a comedian puts a thing up saying, hey, buy me a coffee, I'm, I'm putting a lot of money into comedians trying to do it sort of anonymously. I'm, and I'm not saying this is a hero thing. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it as a, it makes sense right now to try and help people if you can. Like it really, it really does. I, I imagine once this is over, I'm going to be the tight ass bastard that I am uh, <laughs> I and am not by being it. sure that's not the case. I hope that changes, um, but yeah. Is there anything we can support uh, you on that you're doing? Fish is still going on? Fish is still going on. Again, very lucky in the lockdown, more people need it. So our, our numbers are higher than they've ever been, which is amazing that people are listening to us in this time. Um, my new thing, the, the Instagram thing I'm doing every night, show us your shit, is my favorite thing great in the world. Great show. Really it's great so show. It's so fun. Um, every night, if, um, if, you, if you're free at 9.30, I, I talk to someone interesting around the world about all the interesting stuff that they've collected over a lifetime. And uh, Deborah was on it the other night, and I had the editor Guinness World Records on his journeys oh. around the world. Um, you know, the, the chief curator of flies at the Natural History Museum, a man who's lived with time travelers in Italy. Uh, it's just a, a bunch of interesting can we watch his, Can we watch your archive anywhere, Dan? I'm going to put it on YouTube soon. So it's called Show Us Your Shit. Um, and that should be up soon. And it's, uh, it's, fu it's just fun. It's just so fun talking to people and getting your episode was incredible i, I can't wait to get bless your episode you. up. bless you so it's nine thirty every single night are you doing seven nights a week yeah seven nights a week yeah wow i'm only doing five i want nights off Seriously. i'm gonna drop i'm gonna drop up actually i don't have a guest for tonight so i might just not do it tonight i might just direct people to <laughs> just, this video just not turn up yeah um, just not turn up to my own show yeah 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 um uh it, it, i'm sure someone will do it i'm sure someone fantastic will do it um, but, uh, yeah, drop in on Show Us Your Shit, 9.30, uh, and you can watch it for 24 hours on the story after that, and soon they'll be up on YouTube. Really, really brilliant show, and so nice that we are, as you say, we're humanising each other by seeing each other in our homes, seeing each other's kids and pets in the background and that kind of thing. Uh, so check out that show. Dan is a very, very, very charming host. Also check out No Such Thing as a Fish, and you can follow Dan at Schreiberland. And Dan will make stories of all of those things. Um, and I will share them. If he acts the Guilty Feminist, I will share them. And then you can see the book, uh, the charity, and uh, Dan's other work, like Show Us Your Shit. It will remind you of where it is. And that will stay on our stories for 24 hours. Uh, so check those things out there. Dan, finally, can you tell me, if lockdown was over right now and life zapped back to normal, what's the first thing you do? What are you desperate to do? I want to take my son to a park and put him on a swing. That's the first thing. You and know I you want can to do that now, right? Not really. It's not. Yeah, it's not. They, yeah, it's not safe. Don't... No, oh, not at the not moment. Doing it because you're doing the right thing. You are allowed to go and exercise in a park now. Yeah, we go in a park, but I want to go into a playground. I want him to play with kids uh... again. I want him to not feel scared to walk up to a kid and not us go like that. That's the main thing. Is that? I know. I wonder. I you wonder what that's doing to little children that they sort of you know they'll be fine. Children are resilient. They'll bounce back, and the rest of their childhood will be as you know hopefully very very standard yeah. um and people are resilient like when i first started this lockdown down i honestly thought i wouldn't get through it i was crying i was wow i thought i wouldn't cope at all i i it was like i had caffeine headaches caffeine withdrawal but it was like ca the withdrawal of the caffeine of humanity if you will down <laughs> yes. um i was like, i'm an extrovert i get my energy from other people and i was like who am i if i'm not out there doing and engaging and on stage and connecting and you know ha seeing people and you know um and i coped really badly for the first week and i had tom on the other night because a guest internet wouldn't work so we just quickly did a one one with tom oh, nice. it, didn't, it didn't capture that we, we um for some reason it wouldn't it wouldn't download so i don't have a record of it but i'll get him on oh, again yeah. because he said i said what surprised you and then i said what surprised you about my reaction <laughs> anything about me and he said i was surprised how poorly you coped in the first week and I was surprised how incredibly well you've coped since. And it was just like week two, I was like, I am going to find my coping strategies now, put them all in place like architecture and structure. And I am shocked, Dan, how much I now 
actually fear the end of it. I, I don't fear the end of COVID, mm. but I do fear the end of, like, wish the end of COVID would come this second or two hours ago. But the end of lockdown, going back out there with that, that level of activity. Yeah. And I, I am shocked how adaptable human beings are. How much friends of mine who are just completely social creatures are now like, I quite like it in here. It's quite cosy, isn't it? It's quite yeah. comfortable. It's quite nice to just sit down for a while. And I'm doing lots of work, but I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to go to public transport. I don't have to go for drinks. It's quite good, isn't it? It's quite good. It's like, wow, we're adaptable. My God, are we plastic? Exactly. We're such plastic creatures. And I think the smaller you are, the more plastic you are. So I'm sure that whatever your son is losing in social society with children his own age he's gaining in the incredible connection that he's getting with you and you'll probably be so close all your life because of this absolutely and i think i think the other thing to say about how we're adaptable is uh, the idea of if we're talking about things will change and it'll be different we are creatures of habit we will fall back into stuff it's important if we can try and remember the lessons that we're telling ourselves of how to be better in life and better humans and not treat it like a failed new year's resolution not to just slip back into those not filling those two hours where you're not doing something like Ned was saying, you know, just just making sure mm -hmm. the lessons we've got here carry on. Um, they they might not, and that's fine. That's cool. That's not a problem. But it's interesting that we all got the chance to to think about it for a while. Completely, completely. And I think some of them will stick with some of yeah. them will stick with some of us. That's what I would say. All of them won't stick with all of us, but some some of them will stick with some of us, and different ones will stick with different people. Um, is there anything else you want to tell us before we end the new normal? Any uh, any hopes and dreams? Any anything you didn't tell us? Uh, no, I, I'm. Uh, this, thanks for having me on. Is my main thing. It's, uh, it's so lovely to get to talk to you twice now for extended I know. time. Yeah, and. Um, and yeah, just keep doing what you're doing because, as I said before, your show is, you know, we, we, sh we help people with our fish show with depression and stuff like your show actively is changing the world for the better. And I, so keep going uh, in this time. One of the favorite things I did last year was our crossover show, No Such Thing as a Guilty Feminist. It was yeah. a, such a joy. And I really, really want to do that again when we're allowed out. It's going to be so nice um, to just it was so joyful being on stage with you and some of the other ones I got to do with Richard Herring and um uh, drunk drunk women solving crime and things yeah, like that we just nice. had such so much fun but yours I think yours was the first and it just felt so I think both of us have I mean all of those podcasts have brilliant brilliant fans this is not in any way but I think our fans I, th I saw Rubes Walsh who's been on The Guilty Feminist a few times um saying The Guilty Feminist and No Such Thing Fish have very similar energy and I think it's because we share values as human beings. Mm. So although, you're, although you don't talk about your values the way we do, your values radiate off you and you can tell what kind of people you are. So I think the reason it feels like an inclusive space is you're all really lovely, lovely people. And oh, you don't have to be talking all the time about the way you should live your life. What you're doing is being kind and being charming and being welcoming and loving each other and loving your audience. And there's a great power in that. Um, so keep being the wonderful fish that you are. And uh, we look forward to lockdown being over soon. So maybe we can come back and do a, a crossover again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for watching as well. Thank you. Bye Dan Schreiber. See you Deborah. Oh, I forgot to tell you. There'll be a T-shirt based on something you've said today. Um, I always talk about the T-shirt and I forgot to talk about it. So we have an on-demand stay-at-home T-shirt done by the oh, merch yeah. store. And you get 100% of the profits. If you don't want them, you can divert them to another comedian. Cool. Uh, but something ha something you've said today will be picked up by Hannah and it will be on a T-shirt. Please but not I don't the wank thing. Please don't put the wank thing on there. <laughs> it might be something about labour in COVID or it could be something about, I don't know. Um, uh, has anyone got any suggestions of anything before we go, of anything that Dan said before we get cut off? Because we're going to get cut off in the middle. Minute. Well, if you've got any suggestions, can you put them on Instagram and leave them for Hannah? Down with women. Oh, he did say down with women. <laughs> no. He did say down with women. You are absolutely right. I don't know about this t-shirt thing. Oh my God. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. You've got to be very careful what you say on this show because yeah. anything you say could be used as a t-shirt. Two women Yes, do the wank one. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's really, I didn't watch the wank. How about that? I didn't watch the wank. I didn't watch the wank, yeah. Please, the wank thing. People's a lot. Two is enough. <laughs> two women is enough. People are going for two women is enough. Yes, the wank thing. Two good women, Jacinda and my wife. There are only two good women in the world, Jacinda and my wife. No, no need for more than two. I mean, wank, wank, wank we've got here. 
It'll, please, please not the wank thing. Please not the wank thing is funnier. <laughs> that, that's great. I like that. Please, please not the, not wank, the thing. wank thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love Jacinda. I mean, you know, uh, listen, <laughs> Hannah from the merch store is going to have her work cut out just choosing only one. You've given us so much gold, Dan Triber. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we hope to see you again very soon. You and too. Bye bye to everybody out there in New Normal Land. We'll be back tomorrow with uh, Layla Hussein. Um, and we've got lots of wonderful guests coming up who I will soon announce for next week, Monday to Friday, 6 p.m., right here. And uh, feel free to contribute to our Patreon if you are so minded. We would love that. And also we have our merch at guiltyfeminist.com. Check out everything Fish are doing. Uh, thank you and good night. It's time for me to have a large cocktail. <laughs> Enjoy the nappies that await you and the sleepless night, Dan Schreiber. Oh, but it's your, it's your yeah. own fault. It's my own fault. Didn't You've done it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Bye!